I'll bash on because not a lot of time. Uh, firstly, some basic principles. Rome was a militaristic society. Military success underpinned political success at all levels and throughout Roman history. It was the internal dynamic which drove the system. Service in the army was part of the career structure, the cursus honorum of the Roman ruling classes. And support of the army was essential for any emperor and military success was hugely important in Roman politics. We see this reflected in the tradition of Roman generals being awarded a triumph as the ultimate honour that society could bestow, an honour which emperors then took entirely for themselves. And we see it too in various architectural commemorations of military success. Triumphal arches, we see with one of Severus here, the columns of the famous column of, of, of Trajan, again here, but also of Marcus. And emperors were acclaimed imperator after victories and took specific titles, Germanicus, Dacicus, Britannicus, all recorded on coins and official inscriptions. The Romans believed in their divine right to empire, imperium sine finibus, a sentiment widely reflected in Roman literature, Virgil, Ovid, Livy. Uh, indeed, I believe the default position of most emperors from Augustus to Caracalla, with the notable exception of Hadrian, was to seek the expansion of empire. That the invasion of Britain by Claudius was politically motivated is widely accepted. He did not have any military experience, but ensured he was seen as personally involved in the conquest. His victorious army were even ordered to wait for him to arrive in Britain so he could lead the triumphal march into Camulodunum. He was only here for a couple of weeks. He named his son Britannicus. He erected an arch in Rome. This is the uh, wonderful reconstruction here um, uh, uh, produced by Christina Unwin. He erected that, uh, that to commemorate the victory and it is commemorated on coins or the arch is commemorated on coins, this De Britann coin you can see at the top. In the south and east of Britain, the conquest was achieved and maintained with relative ease. The Romans were already familiar with the area because of Caesar's two expeditions in 55 and 54 BC. <clears throat> and there was continued diplomatic and trading contracts thereafter. These are manifested archaeologically in the Roman influence apparent on Iron Age coin types, this uh, diagram taken from John Crichton's book. And in the distribution of Roman artifacts, particularly Dressel wine amphorae, bottom right. My personal favourite is the silver medallion found in a high status burial at Lexton near Colchester, created from a coin of Augustus and was perhaps worn as a symbol of continued friendly contact. Essex man. The emperor received the surrender of 11 kings, which is uh, according to the description of the Arch of Claudius, of which we've seen the reconstruction already. And we see the creation of at least three client kingdoms, the Iceni in Norfolk, the Regni or Atrobates in Sussex and the Brigantes in Northern England. And this diplomatic solution underpinned early Roman control of the province and freed troops to concentrate on areas of greater resistance. Continued conquest was slowed by less favorable terrain and increasing hostility from the indigenous tribes who had had no previous contact with Rome. And it was further delayed by the Boudican Rebellion of AD 60 and its aftermath. Nero may even have contemplated withdrawal according to Suetonius. And then there was uh, a local uprising uh, amongst the Brigantes in AD 69 as well, not to mention a civil war throughout the Roman Empire. But conquest and concomitant expansion was resumed in AD 71 under a new imperial house, the Flavians. Vespasian, the new emperor, had participated in the Claudian campaigns as legate of the Second Augusta. And that progressed rapidly over the next 15 years under successive governors. Roman military occupation was extended north and west across northern England, Wales and Scotland. We'll hear more about Wales later. Petilius Cerealis, the first Flavian appointee as governor, may have penetrated north of the Tyne Solway Isthmus. We have the dendrochronologically established felling date of AD 72 for timbers used 
in the construction of the auxiliary fort at Carlisle, as shown here on the left. Some, some have even postulated that he or even his predecessor was primarily responsible for the conquest of Scotland, though in my view such an interpretation both misunderstands the archaeological dating evidence, particularly coin finds, and flies in face of the detailed narrative of Tacitus. I've always argued that Tacitus's biography was biased in favour of his father-in-law, but he could not have got away with the complete fabrication of events. The conquest of the whole island was the most sensible option and was clearly in sight. Though the possibility that it, it might not be achieved may already have been considered, Tacitus indicates that a halt was made during Auricola's fourth campaign and the line drawn across the most obvious geographical point, the fourth Clyde Isthmus. It seems likely, given the timing, that this relates to the changes in the attitude of different emperors. Vespasian died in 70, June 79 and was replaced by his son Titus. Supporting archaeological evidence for this halt remains problematic. Agricola and forts do not lie beneath forts along the Antonine Wall as was once thought, but it is tempting to point to the line of the road north of the Isthmus from Camelon or Camelon to the Tay at, at Bertha as a frontier. The section of the road north of Dunblane, usually referred to as the Gas Bridge, has along it a series of closely spaced forts interspersed with fortlets and watchtowers, though, as, I, as I depict here, uh, though others see this as more of a protect, protected supply line for the legionary fortress at Inge Tuthiel. More of that in a minute. However, the campaign soon resumed, probably again the result of another change of emperor. Titus died in September 81 and was replaced by his brother Domitian. And the complete conquest of the island was clearly now the intention, as the distribution of temporary camps shows all the way up around here, and the building of the legionary fortress at Inchtuthil here would seem to suggest that Inchtuthil was the most northern legionary fortress in the Roman Empire. But in AD 85, the Dacians crossed the Danube and invaded Nisia, defeating the local Roman forces and killing the governor. This event seems to have been commemorated on an altar at Adam Clissy which records over 3,000 dead. And this altar is here, a suggested reconstruction here, though not for Trajan, uh, adjacent to the uh, well-known Tropeum or re uh, restored Tropeum Traiani, uh, just there. Uh, this is part of the inscription. Well, we're over here in case you're wondering where we are, way over on the border of the Black Sea. Uh, the following year, a punitive expedition into Dacia was ambushed and defeated, and the Praetorian prefect, a guy called Cornelius Fuscus, was killed and a legion was lost. Clearly, the Dacians had become a substantial threat and were rather nearer to home than Britain. And as a result, a legion, the second Adutrix, and some auxiliaries were removed from Britain to the Danube evidence, that Danube uh, frontier, according to the epigraphic evidence. The legionary base at Inchtuthil was given up even before its construction was finished, hence the gaps in the plan, and deliberately demolished, but best attested by the famous hoard of nails, which, which uh, you can see here, which came from the fabrica. And many um, auxiliary forts in Scotland were abandoned at the same time. The coin evidence indicates that this occurred shortly after AD 86. I.e. there's a consistent pattern. Um, it, the sites that we know of this comes from a circle, a consistent pattern of the latest coins being minted from those sites, well, from excavations of, of AD 86, but none of AD 87 have been recovered and 87 we know to have been a large coin minting year. This serves to remind us that Britain was one small remote province in a huge empire and that decisions which affected it were not necessarily or was entirely with, taken with um, 
local considerations in, in mind. In other words, events elsewhere in the empire affected what happened in Britain. For the next 130 years, the history of the northern frontier involves the search for a convenient limit to Roman occupation. On the continent, the great rivers of, of the Rhine and the Danube provided ready demarcators of Roman territory. In Britain, the geographical choice lay between the isthmuses of the Tyne Solway and the Fourth Clyde, though with variations on that theme. The exact location of the frontier at the end of the first century is not absolutely clear. The Tyne Solway isthmus does not seem to have become the, the frontier immediately after the withdrawal from Scotland. At least part of lowland Scotland continued to be controlled by a network of forts, the most northerly of which were at Newstead and Dalswinton, as arrowed here. Though there's some indication that Roman control and influence extended beyond them, for the abandoned site of the auxiliary fort at Elgenhoch, which is up here, which I excavated many years ago, was used by the Romans as a collection point for animals, presumably as part of the exaction of tribute from the area. And this may have continued into the reign of Trajan on the basis of a coin from more recent excavations there by Headland. Within 20 years, however, all these northern forts were abandoned. This final stage of withdrawal was probably brought about by the demands of an extensive military commitment beyond the Danube, again in Dacia. As the Emperor Trajan sought the conquest of that area in two major wars, as depicted on the rolling scroll of Trajan's column. And though we have uh, no direct evidence of troop transfers from Britain at this time, it seems likely that wider imperial politics were again influencing policy, policy in the province of Britain. As a result, we see the frontier line drawn across the Tyne Solway Isthmus. This is usually referred to as the Trajanic or Stangate frontier involving the augmentation of existing Flavian forts to produce a closer spacing of installations along the Stain Gate, that's shown here. The original Hadrianic plan was merely an or, or a further augmentation of this pre-existing frontier by the construction of a running barrier connecting a series of watchtowers at intervals of about 500 meters with garrison gateways every 1.6 kilometers every mile or so, in other words, the turrets and the mile castles. And thereafter, Hadrian's Wall underwent almost continuous modification until its abandonment when the Romans returned to occupy Scotland. The major changes were the movement of forts up onto its line and the construction of the vallum. The former, the movement of forts onto the line, was clearly a recognition that the linear barrier not only served to uh, exclude unwanted incursions from the north, but made it more difficult for the Romans to deploy troops rapidly beyond it. So three gates opening out to the north, which is what they uh, opted to do, seems to me to have been overkill. When the new emperor, Antonius Pius, succeeded Hadrian in AD 138, we see another policy change. Pius was a stopgap choice of successor. He had no military background like Claudius and needed a victory. So we see victory coin issues, as shown here, and an imperial salutation the only one of Antoninus Pius's reign, both linked to Britain, even though it relates to a very restricted area of reconquest, i.e. an area they had already conquered in the Flavian period. And given that the army had just left one linear barrier, which was still undergoing modifications, it's not surprising that they chose to construct another, this time utilizing the shorter isthmus between Forth and Clyde. As originally conceived, the Antonine Wall seems to be modelled on Hadrian's Wall in its developed form with forts attached to the barrier at intervals of approximately 13 kilometres and fortlets again 1.6 kilometres apart between them, though without watchtowers, none have been found. But the Antonine Wall also underwent dramatic modification during its construction with the addition of a series of generally smaller forts, reducing the average spacing to some 3.5 kilometers. This resulted in a denser concentration of for forces than on any other linear frontier in the empire. Though not all frontier specialists agree that there was such a change, despite what I would argue is clear stratigraphic evidence. Some think 
that the Antonine War was always intended to look the way that it did eventually. For me, such a dramatic change, which I think is attested by things like the replacement of a fortlet by a fort at Duntoka or the similar situation at Croy Hill, and you can see here at Rough Castle, the fort added to the back of the pre-existing rampart. Uh, this dramatic change in the disposition of forces that resulted can only have been in response to some perceived threat. So there's no direct evidence of it, except perhaps the destruction of one lowland broch at Roman hands at Lecky. However, whoops, didn't mean to do that. There we go. However, occupation of the more northerly wall was relatively short-lived. By AD 158, the Romans had begun to withdraw back to Hadrian's wall, based on our closely dated, though lost inscription from uh, Hen on the Wall. And this withdrawal uh, doesn't seem to be associated with a change of emperor, though it may be linked to manpower shortages if, as David Brees and I have recently argued, the famous complete inscription from the Tyne shown here, dated by reference to the governor, Julius Verus, records the transfer of legionary vexillations from the British legions, named, to the German provinces that year. It's previously been thought to have been coming uh, from the German provinces, which makes no sense since they're the British legions. But I haven't got time to explain the details of the inscription. Control of the area north of Hadrian's Wall then uh, reverted to occasional punitive campaigns in response to attacks. The famous example of Ulpius Marcellus in AD 84, after, one eight, what, AD 184, after the sacking of forts on Hadrian's Wall, and by the payment of subsidies reflected in the distribution of hordes of denarii. These extended as far north as Burney, arrowed here in Murray, where two such hordes dated AD 193 and 196 have been found on an indigenous settlement site, providing archeological confirmation of the reference in Dio to the Maatai being paid off to maintain the peace when Severus was preoccupied with fighting the Parthians. The security situation apparently became sufficiently problematic to require major campaigns led by the emperor himself. And Severus assembled a very large military force in Lowland Scotland, uh, seen uh, reflected in the size of the, uh, of the temporary camps, as seen here at St. Leonard's, massive temporary camps, 165 um, acres, 65 hectares. Though there's some debate about how far north these uh, campaigns penetrated, possibly only as far uh, as the How the Mans. There's also debate about Severus's intentions. Um, was this simply a punitive expedition? Or was completion of the conquest of Scotland again being considered? Dio says Severus was seeking to conquer the whole island, and Herodian suggests glory was the motivation for his personal involvement in the campaign. Certainly, Severus is styled as propagator imperii, as extender of empire, on a number of inscriptions, and certainly seems to have been an expansionist emperor. All but four of the 18 years of his reign were spent in the provinces, and he took numerous victory titles, as seen here in, on the triumphal arch in Rome I showed earlier, Parthicus, Arabicus, Adiabanicus, uh, it was erected too early to get Britannicus. But Severus died in York in, 2000, in, in, in 211, uh, and his sons, squabbling over the imperial throne, returned to Rome abandoning any interest Severus may have had in completing, in completing the conquest of Britain. Once again, imperial politics trumped any local concerns. And so Hadrian's War remained at the northern frontier of the province of Britain thereafter. That was a romp through a couple of hundred years of history. I hope you were able to follow it. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, yeah, thank you ever so much indeed to uh, Rob, Catherine and Kerry for organising the uh, Friday seminar series and for inviting me too. Thanks also, uh, of course, to Bill 
for providing such a good uh, introduction to uh, the frontiers in Britain. I have to go uh, back a little bit uh, in terms of where Bill left us. We're going to go back in time to about 47 AD, so three or four years after the um, original invasion in, in 43 AD uh, under the Emperor Claudius, uh, because that's the time when the Roman army had advanced far enough westwards and northwards to be confronted um, by the resistant tribes in what is now Wales. And I think it's important to say um, and to mention the obvious, which is that Wales didn't exist at that point in time and wouldn't exist for another few hundred years. Um, but we know a great deal about the, con the Roman conquest of Western Britain, um, partly through archaeological sources, which we'll look at in a little while, but also because we have the writings of the uh, great Roman author Tacitus, who uh, Bill also mentioned earlier. And Tacitus spends a great deal of time in three of his books, the Annals, the Histories and the Agricola, describing various Roman campaigns against the tribes of Western Britain in what is now uh, uh, Wales. He mentions in particular two tribes, the Silures in South Wales that you can see on the map on the uh, top left, and also the Ordovicades. The Silures and the Ordovicades became uh, public enemy number one uh, in the second part of the first century AD <clears throat> in ancient Rome. They were obdurate resistors to uh, the obvious uh, benefits of Roman civilization, obvious probably to the emperors and uh, to the Roman army, but perhaps not to the Britons. And for a period of about 40, 30 to 40 years, the Roman army confronted <clears throat> and fought against uh, uh, and ultimately defeated uh, both of those tribes before that part of Britain became part of the province of Britannia. So there was a concentration of perhaps 20 to 25,000 Roman soldiers in Western Britain for a couple of generations or so towards the end of the first century AD and the beginning of the second century. Um, and we think of it as a frontier in a way that perhaps is different to frontiers that we recognize today and also from other frontiers in the Roman Empire. We're talking about a period of time when the idea of a linear frontier was perhaps not entirely established in the ancient world um, and frontiers were could be zones between Roman occupied territory and also as the Romans thought of them barbarian tribes to the uh, uh, beyond and that seems to be the situation that we have in Wales at the end of the first century AD. The history, uh, we'll move on to that in a little while, but the archaeology or the archaeological evidence for the frontiers in Wales consists primarily of the remains of Roman military camps and bases, uh, some of which were temporary, others were more permanent, and altogether a recent survey gathered um, uh, evidence for about 60 uh, timber and stone military uh, installations in what is now Wales and also on the uh, boundaries of Wales and the marches. Some of these seem to be have been occupied for a very short period of time, others were occupied um, for far longer. Um, the, we also know that the uh, underpinning of the Roman frontier were at least two Roman legions, so units of 5,000 um, Roman citizen soldiers, uh, based in their camps in South Wales and also in uh, on the edge of North Wales in underneath what is now Chester. And the archaeological evidence comes to us in three, primarily in three different ways. We have excavated a number of Roman forts and fortresses in and on the boundaries of Wales. And the top picture on the top left hand side shows Mortimer and Tessa Verney Wheeler's excavations of the amphitheatre at Killian in 26 and 27 still one of the largest and possibly most important excavations uh, undertaken so far in what was Roman Wales. In the middle picture we can see the site at uh, Forden Gaia, which we know was an auxiliary fort and we can see from uh, the uh, earthworks on the ground and also the crop marks that are seen from aerial photographs we can see the extent and the internal layout <coughs> of that particular fort. And then the third method of identifying uh, the Roman frontier in Wales is through geophysics, which over the last 20 years or so has completely revolutionized our understanding of the Roman frontier and also of its garrison. You can see there a, um, a geophysical plot 
of the fort at Llanvor in uh, Wales, which was undertaken about 15 years ago or so. And CADU, uh, the equivalent of Historic England and um, Historic Scotland, um, funded a very large campaign of geophysical surveys that investigated something like 25 forts there or thereabouts. And it's from this evidence that we're able to provide the kind of detail uh, and detailed understanding of how the, fort, uh, how the frontier in Wales actually developed over time. We can see that the legionary bases at Killian ultimately and also at Chester um, were rear wood compared to the majority of the auxiliary camps and other forts uh, in Wales which were pushed into the hilly interior. Um, and from their distributions, we can see that the river uh, valleys and also the coasts were particularly important for the conquest of Wales. I mentioned Tacitus earlier, as did Bill, and from his writings in the three accounts that he leaves us, we can see that there were three main campaigns undertaken by Roman governors in Britain against the native tribes in Wales, particularly the Silures and also the, um, the Ordovicades, and periods in between where we think very little uh, military campaigning took place. The first series of campaigns were very early on, between 40, uh, after AD 47, and the way Tacitus describes them, they seem to have been a campaign to hunt down a particular, uh, a particular British leader who was known as Caratarchus or Caradog, if you're um, uh, Welsh. Caratarchus was an Essex man. He was the one of the tribal leaders of the Catavalloni tribe, um, whose forces were quickly defeated by the Romans uh, in 43. He fled westwards and ended up um, as a refugee with the Silures, we're told. And much of the uh, governorship of Astoria Scapula was spent trying to find him and also trying to defeat him and bring him to heel. <clears throat> the uh, image on the right hand side is of a marching camp at uh, Pen Planai, um, uh, which has been identified from aerial photographs rather than from excavation. And the map on the left shows the number of uh, marching camps that are known from Wales, and that number is growing every year. There are approximately 50, something like that, known in Wales today. And interestingly, not a single one of them has been excavated. So we have no clue um, when most of these marching camps might have been constructed, whether under a, a scapula or, one, or during one of the later campaigns. Um, and it's likely that actually some of them may well have been reoccupied at different times uh, in, the four, in the first century AD. Caratarchus was ultimately um, defeated in a battle in 51 AD, described by Tacitus as a notable victory for Scapula and for the Romans. Um, <clears throat> unlike his family and his entourage who were captured, Caratarchus fled a second time and this time headed up to northern England uh, to the Brigantes tribe where he was imprisoned by the queen of the uh, Brigantes, Cartimandua, who we're told was a client of Rome and she handed Caratarchus the fugitive over to the Romans. He was taken back to Rome and was um, duly uh, paraded in front of the uh, people of Rome during one, during one of uh, Claudius's triumphs. Tacitus records some of the words, apparently, that Caratarchus said to Claudius, presumably in Latin rather than in, um, in British. And if so, if these are the real words that Caratarchus uttered, then they're the first words known uh, uh, spoken by an inhabitant of the British Isles. And he, and he essentially suggests to Claudius that uh, the conquest of Britain was unnecessary um, and that the people of Britain should have been uh, left to lead their lives um, independently. Um, Claudius decided to um, uh, not to execute Caratarchus and the British leader spent the rest of his life in exile with his family and with his entourage in Rome, which must have been a remarkable experience at the end of the first century AD. The map on the right hand side of the um, screen shows the earliest Roman forts that we know of, not all of which have been excavated, <clears throat> not all of which um, uh, are we entirely sure of their chronologies, but what we can see there is that the Romans formed a loose military zone and the marches and the eastern uplands of um, Wales 
as they then pushed their auxiliary forts into the um, Hillier uh, interior in order not only to pursue Karatakas, but presumably to um, make sure that they were able to control the movement of the peoples, uh, including their warriors. Excavations have taken place on a number of important sites. And on the bottom left, um, I show a, uh, a photograph of the famous excavations undertaken by Professor Bill Manning <clears throat> at the legionary fortress at Usk, which almost certainly dates to this particular period, uh, this particular campaign by scapula against the Silures. A little while later, for various reasons which Bill has uh, mentioned, Wales ceased to be a focus of Roman military um, activity in Britain after uh, the reign of, after the governorship of Scapula. A little while later, a new governor, um, Suetonius Paulinus, um, uh, became governor in Britain, and he led a new series of campaigns against the tribes in Wales, which seemed to have gone remarkably successfully, very quickly indeed. So that by 59 or 60 AD, um, so Paulinus and his forces were on the banks of the um, Menai Straits overlooking uh, Anglesey, um, which was where the Welsh tribes and their Druids, according to Tacitus, made their last stand. And Tacitus describes how the natives uh, of Britain and their Druids um, uh, stood as a serried mass of arms and men with women flitting between the ranks, etc., etc., etc. The outcome of the uh, conflict was fairly inevitable. Paulinus sent over some of his troops who, uh, to cross the Menai Straits, and very quickly indeed, they uh, defeated the uh, native resistance and also burned down their uh, religious, re religious groves, thereby ensuring by about 59 or 60 that Wales had been conquered. Events elsewhere in Britain, however, meant that Wales was soon unconquered. And the events include the Boudican Revolt in what is now East Anglia, which forced Paulinus and the majority of the Roman army in Britain to turn away from Western Britain and Wales and head back east in order to deal with the rebels under Boudica and also then to deal with the aftermath. And for another 15 or 16 years, um, most of the focus in Roman Britain seems to have been um, away from Wales until the arrival of a new series of a, a new governor, Veranius, and his successor, Sextus uh, Julius Frontinus, who conducted the third series of campaigns against the tribes in Wales from 73 or 74 AD that appear to have been successfully completed by about 77. After that date, without any more British uprisings elsewhere um, on the British Isles, the Romans remained in Wales for the rest of the Roman period, and for the next 30 or 40 years, they seem to have um, uh, built a network of forts, which you can see here, uh, across the entire area of Wales, including southwest Wales, Pembrokeshire, where new forts have, have been discovered fairly recently. Um, and this is the third and final iteration of the frontier in Wales, which again is not a linear frontier as such, and if we want to look at it um, or think about it in different ways, it appears to be an internal frontier that is not intended to separate Romans from Britain, uh, from Britons, but that is intended simply to make sure that the Britons were under Rome, fully under Roman control, fully under the heel of the Roman army. This network of forts wasn't just about um, controlling people, but was about also controlling their movements and many of these places became uh, the focus or the locus for uh, small civilian settlements where perhaps native Britons would have first encountered the, uh, would have first encountered Roman culture and Roman ideas as well. The picture on the right hand side uh, is a very famous painting by Peter Connolly um, that shows how one of the many aspects of, or the most obvious aspect at least, of life as a Roman soldier. Roman legionaries and auxiliaries, of course, were conquerors. And here we can see them conquering the Dacians that Bill referred to a little while ago. Um, they were also the conquerors of Germans and Gauls and Britons and everybody else. But we also need to see, as Bill alluded to, and as we can see from this map, that Roman soldiers were also builders. 
They were the builders of forts and fortresses. They were builders of the famous road network in Britain and the rest of the Roman Empire. They were also presumably tax collectors and peacekeepers. Um, they had a multi um, a multifunctional role in newly conquered provinces like Britain. And in many ways, in, in places such as Wales, they would have also been the only um, non-Britons that the natives would have looked to in order to understand what Roman material, what Roman culture actually was. And it's in this way, we imagine, that Roman material culture spread throughout Wales and where people began to do things like, for example, speaking Latin and uh, behaving in more Mediterranean ways than they had done before. One of the most important sites, uh, Rob mentioned it earlier, uh, uh, in Wales, in Roman Wales, is the legionary fortress at Caelian, which was known to the Romans as Isca. Um, this is an old photograph of the town of Caelian, which lies just above the city of Newport on the lower banks of the River Usk in southeast Wales. And the red line shows where the shows the outline of the legionary fortress superimposed on top of the uh, modern town of Caelian. And on the western side, you can see there are a number of open areas, fields and playing, playing fields, which, um, haven't, which were not excavated uh, and about very little was known. These are the uh, projects that I started when I worked at um, Cardiff University, both um, geophysical surveys and excavations that have thrown new light on the legionary fortress. And this is now the plan of the fortress of Isca, as we understand it. It's one of the most complete legion, uh, plans of a legionary fortress from anywhere in the Roman Empire. And it illustrates, I think, very nicely how these fortresses were centers of Roman culture, but also uh, of the Roman army and of Roman ideas. It was the headquarters of the Second Augustan Legion, one of the legions that had invaded in 43, um, and is most famous perhaps because a uh, future Emperor Vespasian was legate of the Second Augustan Legion in the 40s. It's also the legion decided not to go to the um, aid of Suetonius Paulinus as he fought against um, uh, Boudicca in 60 and 61, for which it uh, remained presumably um, under some sense of infamy. The excavations at Caelian have revealed that the fortress, the legion first came to that part of South Wales in 73 or 74 AD, and we can be very sure about that, not just from numismatic evidence, but also from dendrochronological dendro evidence too. It was rebuilt, it was initially constructed in timber, as were many of the forts and fortresses in Wales, because they were mobile, dynam um, they were dynamic um, uh, parts of a dynamic um, fortress of, of a frontier. Um, we know that the fortress of Caelian was reconstructed from approximately 90 or 100 AD. And on the top left hand side, we have an inscription that dates to 100, 101, probably that records the reconstruction of a gate in um, stone. Other forts around, around Wales were also reconstructed in stone from the beginning of the second century, including the, including the auxiliary fort at Tomini Mia, which you can see on the right hand side, the little, um, uh, the little hillock is a later English um, uh, uh, castle uh, sitting on top of part of the Roman fort. The history <clears throat> of the Roman frontier in Wales is relatively short lived. We began in 47 and we end um, at the, we end at the time when the focus in Roman Britain, or the focus of Roman governors in Britain at least, turned from the west to the north, as Bill described earlier on. And many of the uh, units that were, had been based in Wales for perhaps 30 or 40 years, if not longer, were transferred away from Wales and up to newly built um, forts uh, on Hadrian's Wall and ultimately on uh, the Antonine Wall. So from around about 115, 120 AD, the Roman frontier in Wales ceases ceased to exist. Much of Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall, including the um, camps uh, that on both frontiers were constructed by the British legions, including the Second Augustan Legion. And here we can see two uh, dedicatory inscriptions, one from Hadrian's Wall and one from uh, the Antonine Wall, recording the work of legionaries based, uh, whose home base was uh, at Caelian 
uh, in constructing those walls. The lower um, uh, uh, inscription, the Bridgeness Distance Lab, shows the legate on the right-hand side of the Second Augustan Legion making an offering, uh, presumably after the 4,652 paces of wall uh, had been constructed. And knowing when this was when this was built, when this uh, inscription was erected in 142, the figure actually making the dedication, making the sacrifice on the right hand side, holding out his hand with the circular patera in it over the altar, was probably a man called Aulus Claudius Carax, who was legate of the Second Augustan Legion at the time, and who also wrote uh, later on. He wrote a nine-volume history of the Roman Empire, which sadly is lost because it would have been interesting to have had his um, uh, insights on what it was like to be in Roman Britain or a legate of a legion in Roman Britain by the middle of the second century. So that's a very quick run through the various different um, stages of the Roman frontiers in Wales. As I say, it's not like any of the other Roman frontiers in Britain or elsewhere um, that you will hear about in this um, seminar series. It's a unique frontier. Um, it tells us a great deal about how Western Britain became part of the uh, province of Britannia. And it's dynamic, not just in terms of its um, history and its development, but also dynamic because new uh, forts are still being discovered almost on an annual basis and excavations continue to throw new light on um, often uh, well-known sites. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Pete. All right, oh. All right I was going to start off with saying hello, Hadrian's Wall. This is Rich for calling. Um, literally here on the site, excavating the uh, amphitheatre, which is a causing no end of confusion to us in the last few weeks. Um, but I'm going to be talking about part of the site, which is half a mile away from that, which is the fort of the Saxon shore. Um, and the others around the coastline. So I won't be talking about the first two um, mid third centuries here as well, but I'll bring in some later stuff as well. So as a brief intro to what they are, uh, this is a typical image you find online of the uh, shore forts around Britain and around the Gallic coast. Um, on this map, the red ones being ones that are mentioned in the late, uh, late fourth, early fifth century document the Notitia Dignitatum. Um, only nine of what are considered to be 11 forts of the uh, Saxon shore are mentioned in the Notitia and I'll come on to those in a bit. So in the Notitia themselves they look like this, this page. Nice pretty pictures of what look like castles of a whole list of names and units in each of them. And this is what it looks like when you pull those out and actually make them somewhat readable. Um, the interesting things to note on this table here is line 17, um, uh, Gariano, where basically it's probably Burkhardt's Castle or Caister on Sea, simply because um, from, from the map before, they are very close together and no one's quite decided which should be which. The other one, my site that I studied for my PhD, being rich for is highlighted because out of all of them, it's the only one noted to have part, whole or part of a late Roman legion. Everyone else has got frontier troops or, or cavalry troops. And again, that's something I'll come on to in a bit. And I, here we go, yes. So um, here's them separated out uh, around the coast. And Walton Castle is slightly considered an 11th shore fort. And again, like I said, if uh, Caister and Burr are treated separately or the same, but most likely separately, given Caister is actually dates, originally dates to the uh, late second, early third century, and Burr is actually undated at the moment, but it's probably in line with the ones I'm going to talk about. So here we go. <clears throat> Splitting them out into how they are traditionally viewed. We have the first early group, the Red Forts here, Brancaster, uh, Caister and Reculva, um, late second, early third century, and then get developed sometime in the third century into um, what's been considered the system of shore forts. So in the green ones, the later second group um, in the late 
uh, late third century into the early fourth century. However, what I decided to do was see if we could separate any of these out into other groupings. So I went through Andrew Pearson's um, PhD and his BAR publication on the shore faults and picked out the two parts of it as he looked at which they had things in common or were different. So I looked at firstly, this table represents the features of the fort, so they've got internal towers or not, ramparts, external bastions, bonding courses, or opsig mortar in the walls. I ran this through what we call a, a, um, so a correspondence analysis, and what came out the other end was interesting. When you plot these based on these features, you can see Reculver, uh, Dover, Coast, and Bradwell all fall very far apart. Um, I think further down on this was actually Brancaster as well out of the list. But interesting, the recall Rich for Lim, Pevensey, and Portchester, as well as Burkhast in this case, all fell in a nice little group, actually right on the same dot. And Rich for Lim, Pevensey, and Portchester are all of the southern forts. I then went further and looked at his measurements for the forts. So the thickness of the wall at the base, the assumed original height, and whether there was internal offsets on the walls present or not. And guess what's coming? Richborough, Portchester, Pevensey and Lim all fall very neatly and very closely together once again. Um, Burr Castle has run off to Reculver and Bradwell falls way, way down on the graph. So this got me thinking about other possible groupings for these forts. I then started to look at cumulative frequency in the um, uh, coinage. I know Philip is in the talk, so I want to talk to her about this at some point. Um, but all we need to know about this graph is when the lines are going up, in this case, it seems like the sites are adding more coins than at a faster rate than the British average. And when it's dropping down, they're adding them at a slower rate. Now, it's hard to pick apart, but Richborough, for correcting for the weird coinage you get at the end of it, um, but Richborough, Lim, Pevensey and Portchester all seem to flatten out through periods 13 and 14 um, into 15 in the late uh, late 4th century, whereas some of the others seem to see a bit of an uptick slightly earlier on. It's not much and it's subtle and there's lots of questions about these kind of graphs. However, given the other evidence, what it led me to was this, as my groupings. I've kept the first group, the early group, Brancaster uh, uh, case from Reculver the same. There is evidence for them in the late 2nd and early 3rd centuries. Dover is an odd one because it does have a, a classis Britannica fort there in the second century. It then has the famous um, Roman painted house there in the third century, which is then destroyed as they build the shore fort through it. But it is an established port. I think it stands, stands alone outside of this before it's developed. I place Richborough, Lim, Pevensey, and Portchester for obvious reasons now, based on the other graphs, together as a group. And then Bradwell, Walton Castle, and Burr Castle are very odd. Walton Castle has completely fallen into the sea. We do not know anything about it. Bradwell is difficult because the only excavations, only good excavations coins came from Victorian excavations. So there was really, or well, some decent ones did. And Burr Castle, again, is a bit odd because all they found there was Constantinian evidence. There was no real evidence for late third century, um, uh, late third century activity. So that was a bit strange, those. Those ones I haven't quite decided upon. However, putting these into their historical context, this is a chronology that I'll put on slides coming up and I'll refer back to. But the main things to note in this is um, the Gallic Empire of the mid third century usurping Britannia and Gaul once they're kicked out in 274 and then you get the second usurpers of Carosius and Electus and make note as well of the failed invasion of Maximian to kick out Carosius from Britain and northern Gaul and as well as Electus being defeated by Constantius Chlorus in two, um, 296. So I'll refer back to this several times but Moving on, the question of the shore forts has always been one of the Gallic Empire versus the Britannic Empire, Posthumus versus Carosius, who actually constructed these forts. There's been lots of debate um, using some of the 
uh, archaeology and then a historical context for these um, and who might have built them. One caveat to this I will always say is I always wondered why the Gallic Empire was considered if the Gallic emperors based themselves in Gaul what was their need for sure forts around the coast of Britain so you can see which way I'm falling already on this. Um, the other thing is, is a site I studied for my PhD at Richborough, because it was so extensively excavated and so widely published, it was used often as a model and the evidence there was spread out and used in the other forts of the Saxon shore to try and bring them into a system, um, a system of forts. But to me, it's why not both? Um, Reasons why not both actually is the Gallic Empire. I don't believe they're there, but it is possible that the earlier forts were redeveloped um, under the Gallic Empire and then later of, of Gracias. They were already forts standing at Brancaster, Caister, and, Recul um, yeah, Caister and Reculver. There's no reason to suspect there wouldn't have been activity going on during the Gallic Empire in Britain at these forts but what the purpose is at that stage is kind of unclear. There's also reason to possibly believe, um, based on the stratigraphy of some of the coins, at Dover, it might have been redeveloped under the Gallic Empire and then later a bit more by Carausius. Um, that's, it's quite difficult and uh, the archaeology there needs picking apart a bit. But again, it was an established port that would have been both useful to the Gallic Empire and Carausius. Now onto the southern forts of Richborough, Lynn, Pevensey and Porchester. Um, these are Britannic Empire. I'll come on to why. Um, but it's interesting that the groups kind of split between established forts and ones in the east and these new ones under the Britannic Empire in the south, covering the south coast of the, what is now the English Channel. So why is this important? Where they were built and at what point in which which coastline? Well, the failed invasion of, Max, of Maximian, Britannia, came from the Rhine. It came from the east. And there were already forts there and potentially others built, um, maybe maybe Bradwell, maybe Walton Castle, um, to protect that coastline. Um, so then Alexis murders Carasius to know free, or supposedly how the history goes. And then the invasion of Constantius Chlora sounds at two places, Richborough and near Southampton, it said Bittern was the other place in the south. So you can see why, after a failed invasion from the Rhine, um, Carasius and then Electus would have been concerned about the second invasion coming from the south and would have wanted to fortify that coastline. Now, the evidence for this does come in from the actual archaeology. Andrew Pearson wrote a great paper on how the forts would have been if, how long it had taken them to build by people hours and materials, depending on who started them and when they were finished. And he wrote this line at the end saying basically much of this discussion about that would become irrelevant if the forts remained unfinished. And I've possibly started to find evidence for that in the Richborough archive at least. So going back to this, just to refresh our eyes in the groupings, in this next discussion, I'm going to be focusing on Richborough, Lim, Pevensey and Porchester, protecting the south coast um, against a possible invasion from Northern Gaul by Constantius Chlorus. So focusing again on Richborough, I'm already sort of contradicting myself, saying most of the evidence for the past interpretation of the shore forts have come from Richborough, and now I'm doing exactly the same, but there is new stuff that's appeared in the archives that was either unpublished or not used, utilised at the time. The focus here, as you can see from this aerial photography, um, is on those three ditches surrounding the great giant platform, what was the Monumental Arch, um, which is a whole other discussion at the moment, and then the walls of the shore fort and the double ditch, massive 12 foot deep double ditches outside. They're the which I'll be focusing on. So traditionally, mid late third century fort is constructed probably under the Gallic Empire, maybe Carausius. The late third century fort is then follows this little fortlet that was the ditches were then filled in and the walls built, occupied throughout the fourth century, 
and then abandoned soon afterwards into the fifth. The ditches themselves uh, surround this monumental arch platform. Um, they also, to the northeast corner, respect an earlier building, which might have been used as a, a commander's office at that stage, because it is a very small fort, maybe it would have fit 500 to 1,000 men, depending on how any possible um, barracks were arranged inside. Um, but I've dated these, and what I'll say the evidence is, dated these to 290 to 296. The first thing to say is the one piece of evidence I've found for their construction date was a coin of Claudius Gothicus dated to the late 260s, um, into, two, uh, yeah, into yeah, 268, I think the coin was, in or under the rampart, uh, under the material for the rampart. So it's definitely constructed after that, which puts it very late into the Gallic Empire. If you remember the dates of 260 to 2745 for the Gallic Empire. However, the actual use of these ditches and the backfilling of these ditches by the Romans is an interesting question. In the original publications, there were several coins noted of Carausius in the ditches. Um, it was argued that these could be intrusive and the ditches could indeed have been dug uh, by the Gallic emperors, and it's still possibly the case. However, there are 12, actually 12 coins of Carausius in those inner ditches, some of which are very near the bottom, which is a very strange thing. I would very, I wouldn't think that many would be that intrusive, um, given the other coins we get in the ditches as well, and the ones much higher up, which are a lot later. It seems like these are solidly in these ditches, and the ditches couldn't have been filled in before 290. What makes these ditches even more interesting is I came across two coins of Constantine um, dated into the 320s. And again, as you can see, one of these is in the filling towards the bottom. And the one at the bottom here, the Sol Invicto Comity, says bottom layer. Going based on this, I started to investigate whether these triple ditches could have been opened during the reign of Constantine. So dug in the late third century and still open in the 320s, in the AD 320s. Um, so you'll see that uh, if anyone's read a recent edition of um, Britannia and is a Star Trek fan here, um, uh, Tony Wilmot did some excavations at Richborough near the fallen east wall, which is on this page here. Um, so the east wall doesn't exist anymore, the fort has fallen down, down the scar. Um, he did some excavations and established where the wall must have stood and it must have stood on what was called an unused foundation by Bush Fox when he excavated, excavated Richborough. Um, long story short, there is a pit cut through the foundation from three feet above, full of coins of the late third century. So that led Bush Fox to believe that this, this wall foundation was built, the wall was moved, the foundation was forgotten about, and then the pit was dug and filled. And Tony was gonna have a lot of special pleading to work out why this was the case, until I spotted that Bertrand Pierce, who was the coin um, expert on Richborough at the time of the excavations in the 1920s and 30s, ignored a coin of Arcadia, so the late um, fourth century into the 390s, um, that was right at the bottom of this pit. And he said it was intrusive because one of the workmen must have dropped it into the bottom of the pit when it was open. It didn't make sense. What also didn't make sense was because all of those coins of the three, um, so the 280s to 290s that Bush Fox thought um, was when the pit was filled, were spread very evenly from top to bottom, as if someone had disturbed a hoard and filled it in much, much later. These coins weren't deposited in any usual way. It's definitely backfilling at a later date. So we know now where the wall stood. There's a questionable coin from underneath the north wall of Carausius, which if it was underneath that north wall, it would date it after 296. And there'd be no doubt that at least that part was built by Carausius. And then, um, 
but again, associated with some of the fort building material, um, there was a coin of a washed out coin of Constantine. So you see this is from, if I go back very quickly, if I can, which I can't. Ooh. How do I go previous? There we go. Yes, so this was in a concrete layer um, near the West Gate. And in that layer was weathered out concrete floor, coin of House of Constantine. Additionally, um, there's the coin actually from the notebook. It says concrete floor, and it's a one of the same as the one above, fell Tempra Caratio. There were also coins of Carosius, two herbs Roma, and Constantinopolis, and two of the family of Constantine, that were found in the lime kilns outside the north wall of the fort. These lime kilns were associated with material that were used, was used in the construction of the shore fort walls. If there were coins, unless these are very, all these coins are intrusive, these coins must have been in there when it was filled in and possibly you in use during Constantine's reign. So putting these two together, what is interesting here is the east wall of the fort is constructed in the inner ditch on the northeast corner, you can see there the one that avoids the building, using it as a foundation trench. I've looked at some of the old photographs and even though they're black and white, it doesn't suggest that the ditch was backfilled and then recut um, for the foundation of the wall. So it's quite likely that this is all one event, that the triple ditches were dug around a, a still standing monument used as possibly as a watchtower, as are some interpretations, and then the shore fort walls were constructed around it. What makes this more interesting is that the north wall, which Andrew Pearson suggested was built in four separate pieces, is the only one, along with the Westgate Towers here, to contain material from the dis dismantled monument, suggesting it was also built either possibly last, as that's the last thing you would take down, or in my eyes, that the North Wall was poten potentially built by in the reign of Constantine and Richborough was unfinished. Now, this links very nicely to a what would potentially be a throwaway line and something that people have um, contended with down at Pevensey Castle. Um, Bush Fox wrote a paper in 1932 on the Shore Forts and he said crawl, after crawling under one of the walls he found a Constantinian coin of the 330s beneath one of the bastions and did not believe that it was intrusive. It seemed too far down, it must have gone in before the wall was constructed on top of it. Linking these two together now, as another data point of Richborough, it's possible that both Pevensey and Richborough were not fully finished when, um, when Electus was defeated and finally kicked out of Britain. It also possibly links to, this is more tenuous, but Pevensey is that really odd round shape. Richborough is also the smallest of the shore forts by a good 40 metres on each side. It's almost as if Richborough and Pevensey were tacked on by Electus to all the later planned constructions during Const Carasius and Electus's reign in the 290s. And they're then left unfinished because Constantius Horus's invasion came earlier than expected. So I'm just going to finish off very briefly on the one big debate, is the shore fort's function defence or supply? Is it defending against anyone or is it supplying the continental armies, particularly in the Rhineland? But again, why not both? The way I look at it is this new timeline. There's a possible use of existing forts, particularly Dover, um, by the Gallic Empire once they are kicked out in the 270s, once they're defeated, um, there's a reoccupation of the existing forts, um, possibly new ones built, um, ready for protecting, Carasius protecting against an invasion coming from the Rhine. After that fails, the construction of the southern forts, as I've said, Richborough, Pevensey, Lim and Portchester, all grouped together nicely in construction, possibly in date. It's really um, difficult to tell with Portchester and Lim, but I'm going to look into more of the archive there and see what comes out. 
I think there's an occupation low in 296 to the AD 330s. Um, the difficulty here is that it is a um, not a very well represented coin period anyway. So the coins aren't necessarily representative of there being an activity. And what I should say here is Richborough Roman Fort was built in the middle of an existing town of which we don't know how active it was during this period. It is rich, but isn't surrounded by a Vicus, which was shown up on Geophys. It is the town that was there for probably 100 or 200 years before. And the fort is a compulsory purchase order by the military of about six or six to nine insulae to uh, build their fort on. Then it's in the 330s that actually Constantine, this reorganization of the military, brings together all of these forts, these existing ones, to supply the army on the continent um, and to, to protect against the invasions coming from all directions. I haven't spoken about the late part of the fort, which is a lot to get into, but there is a possible reorganization based on some of the stratigraphic evidence I've um, reassessed with a Christian church in the corner. There's a question mark on that but there does seem to be a redevelopment as late as the 380s and 390s. What the reasoning for that is, I'm not sure. So just to sum up briefly, who and why? Um, lots of people at lots of different times for lots of different reasons. Um, the AD 330s is still a question mark. It could have been a little before or after that, but it does seem like Richborough was completed. There's some evidence to suggest in the 330s. If we're looking at the Notitia and the Count of the Saxon Short, this could have been a position brought in around about that time. We do have a note from Ammianus Marcellinus of a possible count before AD 367, and then we have Count Theodosius. So the titles are there um, in, uh, in this period. But the question is then why 9 of 11? And what I can't get into now is the Notitia and the date of it and the date the lists that are copied from it. That's a much bigger discussion. But Walton Castle, Bradwell could have been added later. It's possible they were missed off a list that was compiled at a different point. We don't know when the Second Legion moved to Richborough. Again, that's up for debate. It could be early in the period at the fourth century. It could be a lot later. But what's interesting is the Notitia only lists one unit per four across all of them. But we have evidence here for Germanic troops and incomers from the continent at Richborough, as well as cavalry, not just legionary troops. So these are my general conclusions. I'll leave them up on the screen for a little bit. Um, but essentially, the shore forts, if ever were a system, are not probably until the 330s and different parts existed at different points in part different systems for defense, for supply by the Gallic emperors, by Carosius and Electus, and then later by, by the Constantinian armies in Britain. So that's generally how we might start to relook at the Saxon shore forts. And there we go.